This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Introduce my grandmother. Ilse Heller, as my grandmother was then called, had come to Vienna from Bohemia about five years earlier to pursue her piano studies. She was soon taken on as a pupil by Leonie Gombrich, after whom I am named. Leonie introduced Ilse to Ernst and encouraged my grandfather to show her pupil some of the galleries and architectural splendors of Vienna. By 1935 their weekend outings together were well established, and in fact they married the following year. And one Sunday, as my grandmother remembers it, they were walking in the Wienerwald, and had stopped for a break. Perhaps in a sunny clearing, she says, sitting on the grass or on a fallen tree, when my grandfather pulled a sheaf of papers from inside his jacket and said, Do you mind if I read you something? Well, it was better that he read it, says my grandmother now. Even then, you know, Ernst's handwriting was very difficult. That something, of course, was the little history. Evidently she liked it, and the readings continued for the next six weeks until the book was done, for he delivered it to Neurath on time. If you read it aloud, you will find how beautifully those readings shaped the telling of it. The dedication gives an idea of how he appreciated them. The original illustrations were produced by a former riding instructor, and my grandfather liked to point out that the numerous horses he included in his pictures were more skillfully drawn than the people. When the book came out in 1936, titled Eine kurze Weltgeschichte für junge Leser, it was very well received, reviewers assuming that my grandfather must be an experienced teacher. Within quite a short time it had been translated into five other languages, but by then my grandparents were already in England, where they were to remain. In the end the Nazis stopped publication not for racial reasons, but because they considered the outlook too pacifist. However, the seed had been planted, and, despite his other concerns, my grandfather eventually responded to requests for a sequel, this time focusing on art history. This became the story of art. Not for children, because, my grandfather said, the history of art is not a topic for children, but for slightly older readers. It has remained in print since 1950 and continues to make new friends in more than thirty nations. But the first edition of the little history which preceded its better-known cousin lay in a drawer in North London. Sometime after the war had ended, my grandfather managed to reclaim his copyright, but by then the world in which he had written the book seemed very far away. So nothing happened until, more than thirty years later, he received an inquiry from a German publisher who, on reading the book, was captivated by its energy and vivid language. A second German edition was published with a new final chapter, and once again my grandfather was surprised and delighted by the book's success and the many translations that have followed. He took a cheerful interest in tailoring editions for audiences of different nationalities, and was always ready to listen to the suggestions of the various translators. There was one caveat, though. Apart from the little history, my grandfather wrote all his books in English. If there was ever to be an English edition, he was going to translate it himself. Then, for ten years, and despite repeated approaches, he refused to do so. It wasn't just that he was busy, although that was also true— English history, he said, was all about English kings and queens. Would a European perspective mean anything to English-speaking children? It took the events of the 1990s and Britain's increasing involvement in the European Union, as well as my grandmother's tactful encouragement, to convince him that they might. And so, at the very end of his long and distinguished life, he embarked on producing a new English version of the book with which he had started. I've been looking at my little history, he told me with modest surprise shortly after he began, and there's actually a lot in it. You know, I really think it's good. Of course, he made corrections. He added new information about prehistoric man. He asked his son, my father, who is an expert on early Buddhism, to advise on changes to Chapter 10, while his assistant, Caroline Mustill, helped with the sections on Chinese history. It is our great good fortune that Caroline worked with him so closely, for he was still engaged in the task of translating and updating when he died, at the age of ninety-two. With his blessing, she has completed this difficult task meticulously and beautifully.
Clifford Harper produced new illustrations, which I know my grandfather would have loved to see. But some changes, of course, could not be made without him. We know that he intended to add chapters about Shakespeare and about the Bill of Rights, and no doubt he would have expanded on, for example, his very brief treatment of the English Civil War and the birth of parliamentary democracy, which carried less weight for the Viennese graduate who wrote the book than for the British citizen he became. But how he would have explained these things we could not guess, and so the areas he did not revise himself have been left as his thousands of readers in other countries already appreciate them. Revisions, in any case, are perhaps beside the point. What matters is his obvious sense that the pursuit of history, indeed all learning, is an inquiry to be enjoyed. I want to stress, he wrote in his preface to the Turkish edition a few years ago, that this book is not and never was intended to replace any textbooks of history that may serve a very different purpose at school. I would like my readers to relax and to follow the story without having to take notes or to memorize names and dates. In fact, I promise that I shall not examine them on what they have read. Leone Gombrich, April 2005 Chapter 1 Once Upon a Time All stories begin with Once Upon a Time, and that's just what this story is all about, what happened Once Upon a Time. Once you were so small that, even standing on tiptoes, you could barely reach your mother's hand. Do you remember? Your own history might begin like this. Once upon a time there was a small boy, or a small girl, and that small boy was me. But before that you were a baby in a cradle. You won't remember that, but you know it's true. Your father and mother were also small once, and so was your grandfather and your grandmother a much longer time ago, but you know that too. After all, we say, they are old. But they too had grandfathers and grandmothers, and they too could say, once upon a time. And so it goes on, further and further back. Behind every once upon a time, there is always another. Have you ever tried standing between two mirrors? You should. You will see a great long line of shiny mirrors, each one smaller than the one before, stretching away into the distance, getting fainter and fainter, so that you never see the last. But even when you can't see them any more, the mirrors still go on. They are there, and you know it. And that's how it is with Once Upon a Time. We can't see where it ends. Grandfathers, 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 grandfather. It makes your head spin. But say it again, slowly, and in the end you'll be able to imagine it. Then add one more. That gets us quickly back into the past, and from there into the distant past. But you will never reach the beginning, because behind every beginning there's always another once upon a time. It's like a bottomless well. Does all this looking down make you dizzy? It does me. So let's light a scrap of paper and drop it down into that well. It will fall slowly, deeper and deeper, and as it burns it will light up the sides of the well. Can you see it? It's going down and down. Now it's so far down it's like a tiny star in the dark depths. It's getting smaller and smaller, and now it's gone. Our memory is like that burning scrap of paper. We use it to light up the past. First of all our own, then we ask old people to tell us what they remember. After that, we look for letters written by people who are already dead. And in this way, we light our way back. There are buildings that are just for storing old scraps of paper that people once wrote on. They are called archives. In them you can find letters written hundreds of years ago. In an archive I once found a letter which just said, Dear Mummy, yesterday we ate some lovely truffles. Love from William. William was a little Italian prince who lived four hundred years ago. Truffles are a special sort of mushroom. But we only catch glimpses, because our light is now falling faster and faster. A thousand years, five thousand years, ten thousand years. Even in those days there were children who liked good things to eat. But they couldn't yet write letters. Twenty thousand, fifty thousand. And even then people said, as we do, once upon a time. Now our memory light is getting very small, and now it's gone. 
and yet we know that it goes on much further to a time long, long ago, before there were any people, and when our mountains didn't look as they do today. Some of them were bigger, but as the rain poured down, it slowly...